Good morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Please stay tuned to the end of today's program for a brief summary on our, all of our upcoming programs, and please consider becoming a member of the World Affairs Council Town Hall. You can check out all the great benefits on our website at lawacth.org. For those of you who would like to submit questions today to today's program, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which would start in about 30 to 35 minutes. It is now my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. On Tyranny is our democratic republic on the brink of authoritarianism. With Professor Timothy Snyder, who's a professor of history at Yale University, Nora Krug, author, illustrator, associate professor at Parsons School of Design, and our moderator, Daryl Holter, CEO of Felix Chevrolet and co-owner of Chevalier's Bookstore, and a Los Angeles World Affairs Town Hall board member. The new graphic edition of On Tyranny will be released this week. It's available at Chevalier's Bookstore, the oldest bookstore in LA, and a link will be provided to you on the chat. With that, Daryl, we're so thrilled with you moderating today's program. Nora, Professor Snyder, we have a terrific audience signed up for you today. Thank you all for your time. And let me turn it over to you, Daryl. Well, thanks so much, Kim. And thanks to all the, uh, the, the members of the group for this. Uh, uh, and, and, and Tim and Nora, you know, getting together with you today is a, is a real treat. Now, this is a very timely uh, and very exciting book. And it was an exciting book when I first read it, when it was in the, the little manifesto form uh, in, in 2017. So I was so excited about it that I kept buying more copies and giving it to people to read. I found that other people were doing the same thing. It was it, it's like a manifesto for our for our time. Uh, and uh, of of course, when I read it again in the in the new form with the, the the beautiful graphics and wonderful graphics that that have been added to it, illustrations by Nora, I, I could really see that it was really an eye opener. And I, I'd really like to start by asking this question about kind of where it came from. I mean, Tim, was it that you were you were you were si sitting around and you you came up with a idea of using art? Uh, were, were you and did you search searched out Nora or Nora was it you had read this and thought that it would be interesting to attach these these illustrations to it to, to give it a, to give it more meaning or perhaps the two of you were meeting having a glass of wine and talking about the decline of our democracy and and were thrust into this this great uh very compelling collaboration of politics and art uh, no, the, there's a correct answer to that, and it's uh, it's 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 number it's number one. But I mean, here's how I would think about it, Daryl. I, I would say that it has to do, in some sense, with with Nora trying to fig to figure out her life and its relationship to German history, because we have we have a point of intersection, but it's not so much about us as people. It's more about us in what we're trying to do with our work. So, so Nora wrote a wonderful, beautiful book called um, called Heimat or or Homeland, which is her in, her investigation of, of of her little part of Germany and her family's part in its its history, and so that's her life coming to a certain point, a certain kind of artistic expression. And I read that book, and when I read that book, I said, "This is the person who should illustrate on tyranny." I didn't have any other list of candidates. I, I, the idea that it could be illustrated was in my mind, but I didn't have the person. But once I read the book, I thought, okay, now I have the person. And so I was intersecting with Nora at a certain point in her life and a certain point in what she had written about. And what she had written about uh, was historical. It was about Germany, but it, and it, it, it exposed history in a way which I found very sympathetic. But it was also important to me that her sensibility was very different from my own. And I thought, and if I was, there was going to be an illustrated edition of On Tyranny, I didn't want it to just be like On Tyranny with pictures. I wanted it to be something new and different and interesting, which it now is, thanks to her. 
Yes, I think so. Nora, how, how about you? This uh, Tim's described a little bit about your process, but and we will ask more about it and more examples, but in, in terms of the initial um, collaboration. Yes, I mean, I was very excited, obviously, when Timothy first introduced the idea. And um, as he just said, it was a, um, you know, I, I felt a, a kinship, obviously, because we're so focused on the subject, you know, similar subject matters. And in that way, it felt like a natural continuation for me uh, from the previous project I had been working on. And um, I also was very, very uh, grateful and continue to be very grateful to Timothy for his openness because he, as he just mentioned, um, it, it, it became sort of a, a dialogue, uh, uh, you know, on, for me as well. He was very encouraging for me to come up with my own ideas while, of course, keeping his text uh, at the center of the process, but um, encouraging me to reinterpret re it in my own way. Yeah, and I think you've, you've really succeeded. And, it, 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 you know, it's a great work in that, in that respect of bringing this kind of connection between politics and art in a really creative and interesting, interesting way. You know, you know, Tim, when I, when I first read On Tyranny and, and uh, four years ago, when I first met you and we were able to chat a little bit when you were in Los Angeles, um, uh, and, and after reading it again, after four years, I, I was struck by this kind of brutal fact. Uh, you know, I spent, as you know, uh, my earlier academic career studying uh, European history in the 20th century. And a lot of things, a lot of the lessons that you talked about, I was somewhat familiar with them when I when I first read the book. Uh, what was interesting is that rereading the book in 2021, how I felt I no longer really needed to draw from those lessons from European history in the 20th century because I had five years of history in America to draw some of the, to, to underscore some of the same a, a kind of, of lessons. And I, I think that's, that was really an important thing that all the viewers might think about who have already read your book to take another look at it in light of uh, what we've really seen. Uh, Tim, you know, you opened up with this sentence, history doesn't repeat, but it does instruct. What more have we learned over the last five years? Well, I mean, thanks, thanks for that. Thanks for that question. I, so it, when I was writing on tyranny, I was following the principle that I thought should apply to everybody, which is that we're in an emergency, we're in a crisis, and everybody needs to bring what they have. So if you're a lawyer, you've got a certain set of tools. You know, if you're a historian, you're another set of tools, an artist, another set of tools. I was bringing what I had as a European historian. I wrote, I wrote that book very, very quickly. And it had to be on the basis of things that I thought I understood and thought I understood clearly enough to, to, to re-encapsulate for Americans very quickly, you know, on deadline, basically, in a few days, which is, which is what I did. And the logic was, let's take a situation which is confusing and chaotic and let's apply to it situations from other places and times that we recognize as important. So we, we recognize that Stalinism is important. We recognize that Nazism is important. We recognize those references. So let's take the wisdom from people who live through things like that and see if any of that wisdom helps us to clarify what's going on in America. That was my idea. I was never trying to say that we were separate from all of this. I was trying to say, here are some guideposts and maybe these guideposts can lead us back. And my hope was, Daryl, and I think this has happened in the course of the past five years, is that then what happened after 2016 would be more intelligible because we would have terms for it. We have concepts for it. We wouldn't keep getting surprised because if you're surprised over and over again in a negative way, you start to feel helpless, right? So I do want people to feel surprised. I want people to feel like others have dealt with things like this. Here is some advice. We can, we can not only react, we can, we can get out ahead a little bit, right? We can realize that we are in history. And so what I like about your question is, like the recognition that we are in history. Because part of our problem in the 90s and in the first decade of the 20th century, 21st century was this idea that history is over. Like all the bad stuff is gonna go away. All, all the good stuff is gonna come. We don't have to think about values. We don't have to remember the details of the past because there's only one possible outcome. And the truth is like, if you forget about history, it's gonna come back for you, right? Which is what has happened, right? Every, like all the lessons in my book but not just in my book, all the lessons of like the classics about tyranny, 
they are just all back right now, right in front of us, like right in our windshield. They're right there, right in front of us um, because we have chosen to ignore history, right? So I, I appreciate what you're saying. And I mean, what, one can tick off the things that have happened in the last five years, like there's been attempted coup d'etat by a sitting president, you know, all kinds of things which would have seemed unthinkable if you're only thinking about a narrow, optimistic, a historical version of the US. But once we let history back in, everything becomes thinkable again. We, we're less surprised, we're more ready to act. And that was that was the idea of the book. Yes, and American exceptionalism, as, uh, you know, depending on ideas of checks and balances, and I don't really see them in place anymore. One of the really interesting things that you said it, when you responded to this question, I just want to follow up with you. You said everyone has something to bring to the problem. You said everyone has something to contribute. Uh, when, and that's kind of what we want to do with this, with this book is that everybody, whether you're an attorney, whether you're this, whether you're that, we all have something that we can do. And I think that's a positive uh, aspect which you talk about in you, when you get to some of the later lessons as well. I think that's really important, Tim. Thank you for that. Um, Nora, uh, your art really illuminates many of these important lessons that Tim offers. Uh, and you know, I wondered, how do you actually do that? I mean, how do you decide which image to use to express the key points that Tim tries to convey. Now, some of these points that Tim tries to convey aren't necessarily simplistic points. He makes them see, he breaks them down so we can understand them, but they are a little bit complicated. Uh, and sometimes they need to be, we need to re-understand, we need to understand them again. Uh, and th here's, here's, here's one example. And why don't you talk a little bit about Thomas Jefferson's quote which Tim talks about and your images around it. And maybe you can pick up some of the other concepts that Tim talks about and show us the images that you use to express those, those concepts. Yes, for me, of course, the text is always at the center of the process, of the work process, but it's important to me as an illustrator that I don't um, translate the text one-to-one uh, -one into images because I think that would just make it flat. So my goal was to create a, a second layer, an additional layer that hopefully would be a poetic layer that would provide a different kind of emotional access to the, the things that Timothy writes about. Um, and what was also important to me, which is, as you can see in this example, um, part of the entire book, um, is the combination of my own illustrations, uh, such as the, the guy looking through the magnifying glass and into the mirror, and then uh, found objects and images and also images from uh, archives that um, somehow relate, relate to the text from different periods of time and also different cultural um, contexts. So uh, by combining these different materials, I wanted to underline that tyranny is timeless and universal and also what Timothy just mentioned, which is that we don't exist in a historic vacuum we are uh, made up of the past and we have to recognize that the past is always present and i think illustration has an important role to play in that because it can show us in a very uh, visceral and direct way that um, things have happened in the past and that we need to remember them and learn from them and so for for instance for this for this quote, quote about eternal vigilance vigilance being the price of liberty i chose an old photograph um, that was taken in Louisiana um, and it shows two escaped former slaves. Um, and um, I, I chose to use this as an example and I, I hand colored this historic photograph in order to bring it into the present so that we see a clear connection between the history of slavery and present day racism. So that was you know, just one idea on, on this spread. Um, I don't know if we should look at some others. Um, well, let, let me let me comment a little bit on that, and then we can look at a, a couple more. What what Nora said, I thought was really uh, important. That she is adding a second layer, a poetic layer, uh, to to provide an, an emotional aspect uh, to the to these writings. And w when you look at this quote from Thomas Jefferson and what he's talking about. You know, he's he's talking not just about an external enemy. He's talking about an internal, uh, an internal problem. And even this whole this whole issue of terrorism, the way it's been just defined in our country for all these years, has been defined as the only kind of terrorism was external terrorism. There was no such thing as internal. There was no such really with the with the 
with the uh, exception of a few groups, you know, no one was really looking at what internal terrorists, domestic terrorists were really doing. And we saw it in January, January 6th. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even today, when we use the term terrorism, we often think of foreign terrorism or something that we can't quite understand. That's not homegrown necessarily. And um, that's how I tried to depict it by showing the man in the second image, looking into the mirror and looking at himself with his face had, taking on a kind of aggressive look. I mean, I think another way to, to, to look at this, uh, 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 Tim and Nora, is that, you know, the first time I read On Tyranny in, in 2017, I was really jarred by the whole language that was being used in it. And, and, and the fact that it was not a big, long, detailed piece, but it was, it was, it was small. It was, it was a manifesto. It was a manifesto. A manifesto is something that you can carry in your pocket and give to people and read relatively quickly, I think. That's the way I would define a manifesto. And it, this crystallized some of my fears. It underscored concerns I had. It kind of deepened my, my pessimism. But it also made me want to share Tim's writings with others. And, and I found, Nora, your images are disturbing many of them as well. I mean, you've got an example of it right in front of us. Uh, how, how these images can really jar our consciousness and force us to think more deeply about what we're really doing and about what we're going to do and what we should be doing. And, and Nora, that's done by design. How do you do that? Where do you, where do you find these images? How do you put all this together as an artist? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's both an intuitive and a controlled process. I think it always has to be a combination of both. So I look at, you know, I read Timothy's text. I basically illustrated it chronologically from the first chapter to the last, because I wanted to, to move through the book with a reader. Um, and I wanted to understand how they would look uh, at the images and progression. And so I, I read each chapter one after another, again, after I'd read the, the whole book before. Um, and thought about ideas, visual ideas, um, and again, you know, thought about places to look for found materials that could underline the historic. I mean, I, I resorted to, or not resorted is the wrong word. I used historic photographs when I when, when I thought it was more important to convey a specific moment in history rather than redrawing it, because I think those images can also be really jarring when you see the exact moment in time when something happened that we shouldn't forget. I feel like we owe it to the people depicted in these photographs to look and to witness that moment that they were suffering through. That's why I chose to in include historic photographs. So with every chapter I thought about, you know, is, is there something in there that deserves to be illustrated through a historic photograph or what's better, you know, what's better in the form of an illustration where you can convey something on a more poetic and less factual level. Nora, why don't you show us some more uh, examples of, of these lessons as you've illustrated them in your art and, and talk a little bit about what those lessons were and, and the, the art, art that you've used to convey that, the meaning of those, uh, of those lessons. So this, this spread is from the chapter Believe in Truth and it talks about, I mean, I don't really, I, I feel a little, you know, uh, nervous uh, trying to summarize what Timothy was thinking. So I'm just going to say it in a few word, uh, words. It's uh, obviously about the importance of believing, believing in truth, uh, about um, uh, doubting things that, that are just being said online, about uh, it's as much as it is about truth, uh, truth, it's also about lies. It talks about Donald Trump's um, regim daily regimen of lying, I think, on average, he uh, he lied 27 times a day. Is that, is that correct? That's at the beginning. It, it got more. It got to be more than that by the end. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I uh, on the left page, I, I used this found um, postcard. They were referred to tall tale postcards. They were from 19, uh, 1910, 1920. And there were postcards that were used, um, that were sold commercially and that showed some form of exaggeration. And I wanted to convey this idea that we've always enjoyed, you know, witnessing lies or witnessing exaggeration and, and boastful behavior. And that that's something that we should maybe think about more critically, that, you know, it's not, it's not a joke to listen to somebody lying to us. We have to recognize this as something dangerous. Um, Maybe we can go to the next image. Um, and this this uh, particular paragraph um, talked about um, conspiracy theories and our tendency to believe uh, 
in fictional counter worlds uh, and also the idea that um, if we um, describe a person or a political figure such as Hillary Clinton in this case in a, in a negative light that if we repeat this over and over again, if we re repeat this lie or hear it repeated over and over again in our heads, this person transforms. And so I try to capture this idea of a transformation from a normal human being into a, a monster through this, this expression of six images. Yes, and that was that was really powerful. And Tim talked about this in, in, in it too, but we, we saw it too. I mean, we saw it with, with Trump on TV. We talked about, you know, uh, lock her up, lock her up. Uh, you know, we saw it, you know, time and time again at these events and these rallies, and you can see the way that this this character on the on the right hand page here, the way this character, as she begins to incorporate uh, these lies as truth, uh, how she begins to evolve and change into something totally different than what she was. And when when you look at the polling right now, that people believe that the the election was was rigged or was unfair. They believe that Trump won. I mean, it's astounding. Uh, and I mean, it, it totally validates this idea of, of this, this shamanistic incantation, incantations that, that Tim talked about. Nora, why don't you give us a, a, another uh, example? Um, I believe this is also from the same chapter and it talks about uh, propaganda on the right hand side and um, uh, what, what was important to me in general for the for the book was that I in, that I show the traces of how the images were made in the book. Um, that I, I I used a lot of collage style images. I on some spreads I actually tore the paper. I wanted the reader to become a part of the process of destruction and reconstruction. To me, the whole idea of illustrating this book was not only uh, the idea of uh, creating something, but also of tearing something down, of uh, allowing the reader to question, um, you know, fixed notions that we have of terms such as history or tyranny or uh, also the images that we associate with war and history are, are very set to a certain degree. So I, I saw part of my role in deconstructing these notions and tearing them down and then reconstructing them. And I wanted to do that in a very visceral way, showing the traces of, of my process so that the reader almost could feel that they were also involved in this process. Um, it was also, you know, meant as a, as a call for action, as a way of saying, well, you are, you know, we are all part of this uh, deconstruction of democracy if, if we're not paying attention to what's what's happening and what we're doing and to the decisions that we make every day in our private lives that have consequences for the lives of others. And so on the left hand side, um, the last paragraph is actually printed uh, um, upside down on purpose so that the reader is forced to turn around the book and when they do, the face transforms from you know a more harmless looking university professor into a, um, a a Nazi figure basically and so by turning the book around the reader again is part of this process of of change of negative change and deconstruction and um, I, so I, I, it was important for me to, to integrate this physicality into the book as an object. Yeah I mean, what, a, what an interesting way to do it Nora and what a great example of how art can contribute to a political understanding or deepen our political understanding. You know Tim in writing what he wrote made made the point but, but but now you can turn the the book upside down and really see it in a in an illustrated and a graphic way. It's quite powerful. Do, do you want to show us one more before we move on to the question? Do you have another one, Nora? Uh, yeah, maybe this one. Um, another thing that was important to me was this idea of witnessing, which uh, you know Timothy. I think Timothy's book is um, a call also to to witness, you know, to look back at the past, but also to witness what's happening at the moment, to recognize patterns. Uh, and to to stop them uh, as as you know as early as possible, and so this I, I try to convey this idea of witnessing by uh, facing by showing figures that face the reader, um, and I've done that throughout the book. I've done that with the photograph we just looked at of the uh, escaped former slaves as well, um, and to me this is a way of saying uh, you know look at me, um, be, you know what do something or it's it's underlying this this idea that of, of the book being a call for action and so on the left hand side there is a historic photograph of two 
uh, German men in uniform or, or um, Austrian men in uniform who um, applied a sign to, to Jewish shop windows um, during you know the, the time of the Nazi regime, basically discouraging people from buying uh, uh, products at uh, Jewish shops. And this man is looking straight at the reader as if he's asking us, you know, would you would you join me in doing this? Would you join me in boycotting these people's shops? Um, and the woman on the right is a Jewish woman because the text on that page talks about a Jewish life disappearing in Austria at the time. And the woman also looks at the reader as if to ask, you know, will you will you help me from you know, not, not disappearing. And so you're confronted with these two perspectives and you have to, you have to commit to hopefully the one on the right. Yeah, I think it's really powerful. And, you know, one of the ones that maybe not be on the, on the screen, but one of the lessons in, in number nine about be kind to our language is something I just wanted to bring up uh, when, when, when Tim wrote it. And, and I, I don't think it's in the, the illustrations that we can show but it's uh, avoid pronouncing phrases that everyone else does. Think your own way of speaking, even if only convey the thing you think everyone is saying. Make an effort to separate yourself from the internet and read books. Now that's the one for all the books, <laughs> booksellers and the people that need to re read books. And I had to put that one in. Um, I wanted to ask both of you uh, a question about the marketing of, of this, this new volume. It's this exciting new volume. You know, Tim's pocket-sized manifesto, as I mentioned, was was really convenient for all of us to carry around and take. Yours is yours is larger, uh, and we can't put it maybe in, into our pocket. But do you think that this allows the Tim's message, uh, other lessons, to reach a broader demographic audience? Do you want to answer that? I mean, yeah. so. Let's hope so. I mean, so look, when I wrote on tyranny, it was meant, as you say, to be accessible also in the physical sense, right? I mean, it was it, the, 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 it was produced very quickly and very simply, and the price, especially at the beginning, was very, very low, and that was deliberate because there was an idea. I mean, use the word marketing, but there, there are forces other than that at play here, you know, from me and not only from me. I mean, people who are not just me and Nora who are involved in this book are thinking about it in terms of you know it's it's transformative purpose and not just you know in terms of the in terms of the cash nexus but it was meant to be as you say something you can carry around and over and over again i get the confessions from people who say i carry a copy in my purse or i carry two, two copies in my purse so i can give one out and that's wonderful you know, that's wonderful but this as you say is something different i mean this for one thing takes longer to read it's 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 not as though the illustrations you know mean that you can skip through it or make it an easier book. The illustrations add not just one layer. I mean, Nora spoke of adding a layer, but the illustrations add several layers, and they mean that some of the words come through in a way which may take some some time to think about, right? So the like the very first illustration that you showed, um, I don't know, Claire, if you have like the the ability to make that pop back up again. But the very first one with the formerly enslaved people and the quotation that runs from one page to the other page, that's one of the rare references I make in the book to American history. And then what Nora has done with that is that she'd made it, she's made it much more important in the, in the graphic edition than it was in the illustrated one. Because if you're an American reading that and you follow this little trail, you realize, oh, these words are pronounced, maybe Jefferson said them, who knows, but they were pronounced for sure by this abolitionist Wendell Phillips, right? And so then you follow that little orange dot, and then you're, if you're, you're looking at this picture of these enslaved people, and you're thinking, you know, aha, as you, as you said before, Daryl, um, the problem of eternal vigilance isn't the problem of looking outwards, it's the problem of looking inwards. And that's a lesson, I mean, that's a little point, that, that for me, that was an aside originally, right? But now it's not an aside anymore. I mean, I would venture to say that with, you know, with, with the orange trail and with the photograph, a thoughtful American is going to pause on that point longer than he or she would have would have in the in the initial edition. So we're going after something else. It is meant to be more accessible. I certainly was thinking about younger readers, but accessible doesn't necessarily mean easier, right? Accessible can also mean that the book gets access to your mind in different ways across different channels. 
And I think the, bro the it certainly does that. When I when I when I read it, I mean, I wrote the book, right? But when I when I read it, I don't feel like, oh, this is something which is familiar to me. I feel like my own words are now coming coming at me um, from all of these different angles, and feels differently. Like the internal, my internal reaction to it is very very different. So. Yeah, it's meant to be more accessible. Yeah, it's meant to get to young people. But also there's this exciting part of, you know, two different sensibilities about presentation coming together and creating something that neither of us could have created. And I hope a lot of people will like that. You know, I, I hope that will work, right? But part of it is also the adventure of it, right? Like, which is not a word that marketing people like. Like you don't talk to marketing people about adventures you're having, but this is an adventure right like my writing the book was an adventure nor illustrating it was also an adventure from her point of view and now we have this thing together which is unpredictable and i think very beautiful and i hope it's going to reach lots of people but honestly like if i thought too hard about reaching lots of people i would never have been able to do what i did in the first place i think the same is kind of true of this as well i think it will but i think partly it will because it's unexpected and un unusual and not exactly what people think it's going to be when they open it up Right. And just to follow up a little bit on both of your comments with respect to art and politics and, and this, this emotional aspect that one can derive by studying these images, which it's kind of hard to do just, just in, the, in, the, in the printed word. But that particular thing, when you talk about looking inwards, you're also talking about not just looking at domestic terrorism, but actually what individuals think about themselves. I mean, how, how are individual people fragmented as we are out there, you know, we're busy with this, that, that and the other thing, but what are we gonna do about this problem? I mean, what actually are we going to do? We, we, we have to think about, this is our problem. This isn't somebody else's problem. This is our problem. What are we gonna do about it? And I think some of the, some of the artistic images allow us to, or force us and perhaps compel us to think about these things more more clearly than we would uh, maybe the first time around. That's kind of the way I look at it, at least. Then, um, well, Dirk, Dirk, can I say something about that? Because I mean, please, I think that's please do. True. I mean, in in on tyranny, I'm citing the words of people who lived through Nazism or Stalinism or late communism. I'm citing the words, and it's important that they're people because they're people who had experiences. But you think of people differently. When they're when they're pictured, so Nora doesn't illustrate most of the people that I write about, but some of them she does. And one of them, uh, for me, very tellingly, um, is is a woman called Teresa Prekorova, who was um, who who was you know what we would call a rescuer during the Holocaust. And when I cite her words and her actions, I'm doing one thing. But Nora, at that point in the book, does something that she doesn't do that often, which is she stops and she actually tells a story like frame by frame, chronologically, frame by frame by frame by frame. And when we watch this young woman, Teresa, do what she does, frame by frame, illustration by illustration, that is different than just knowing that she did it, right? Like my, my lesson, for the lesson that, that she is that she is in is, is stand out. And the point about her is that when other people drifted away from their former friends, she stayed close to her friends. She behaved, as she herself said, normally in the sense that she didn't change and everybody else changed. Saying that is one thing, but watching it is another thing. And for me, there's an illustration, like right in the middle of it, she's going to the ghetto and she's bringing food. And in Nora's illustration, she's carrying a basket. And for me, like that basket was the whole thing. Like just from like the, the basket makes it real. If you're gonna help someone, you have to plan ahead. You have to plan ahead, think about what you're carrying carrying something it's a basket like that basket made the whole story much realer for me um and, and and so that's just a little tiny example of how illustrations work to make people not just sources of words but to make to, to so you can follow what they did with their bodies and the risks that they took and like the plans they had to make you know not everything is just about impulses and feelings but it's about trying to remain yourself and then doing things that are consistent with remaining yourself. And that involves some planning and some details, right? And so that's that's an example where Nora's illustration is really told for me that came across. Yeah, that's really a powerful example. And, and this, in fact, is the image. If you can see it, there she is with the basket. And, uh, you know, it, it brings it all back to us. You know, this isn't somebody else's problem. We need to try to figure it out. You know, I've got more questions. I'm, I'm really going to withhold them for right now. I think we could go on for a long time, but I know there are a lot of people 
that are, are watching this uh, event, and I know they, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, something, Daryl, though, about that image. Did you know? Please. Oh, please, yes. Yeah, sorry, just just uh, as a conclusion, yeah, I, I, uh, I think it's all it's all about empathy. I think that when we see images, we are able to empathize, and little, uh, you know, objects like a basket can make us feel what it what it was like. Um, and I think that's also the role of an illustrator. Is, I think is to empathize and to convey that empathy to the to the viewer to the reader. And um, that was that was an important uh, goal for me in the in the book. And thank you for adding that addition to it, Nora, because again, this, this whole discussion has been very, very interesting and enlightening to me, this, this very intense collaboration of politics and art and how it can be put together in creative new ways. I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Jessica to handle questions. I'm sure there are a lot of them. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah, so we have a lot of questions. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, before we launch into the Q&A session, I would just like to thank our viewers and our audience and our members for your continued support of the World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Um, as you know, we are not able to do in-person programs right now, so we do really need your support to continue events like this, either by becoming a member or making a donation. You can visit our website at lawacth.org and uh, become a member or donate there. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Professor Snyder, it's great to have you back at the council. And Nora, thank you so much for um, joining us today and for those incredible graphics that you have shared. Um, our first question, Nora has beautifully characterized the past history of fascism. What does she see happening to societies in the future? Oh, God, I, I think that's really um, more a question for Timothy. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. So they really liked your images, uh, how you characterized fascism in the book, and they're wondering what you see in, from for societies five years in the future. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an important question. It's one that we all have to ask ourselves because obviously we have to plan for it now. We have to, uh, you know, engage now to prevent uh, what happened from happening again, including in the United States. Uh, I find it very difficult to predict because I'm not, you know, a historian. Um, but uh, I, I see a variety of good and bad scenarios happening, and I, I think, yeah, I don't know if Timothy wants to enlighten us. I just want to, well, <laughs> I just want to say that the, the, the question itself reveals the success of Nora's illustrations, because suddenly we're thinking of events in the past as being part of our present like they've suddenly become real to us. Like what her, one of the things her illustrations do, not just in this book, but they put the past into the present tense so that you're suddenly identifying with, you know, having some kind of relationship with the people that you're reading about. And once the past is in the present tense, then naturally you start thinking about the future. And it's nice that Nora says that like historians can predict the future. You know, I I try to make very few predictions because I've got kind of a winning streak going, um, but, uh, but, <laughs> But the, the main thing that I would say here is, is about art. Like Daryl was going to ask a question. He didn't get to it because Nora and I were so, you know, we, we talked a lot. But he was going to ask a question about what lesson I would have added. And I, I do have a lesson about um, being, being kind to the language. And I have a lesson about taking care of the face of the world, which, sort of, which are both in their different ways about art. But without saying what the future is going to be, what I, what I would say is that we need art so that we can imagine the future for better or for worse because without sources of creativity it's very hard to be creative and if we can't think about the future as containing like both really negative and really positive possibilities then we tend to get stuck and we tend to spin our wheels in the present and as we spin our wheels in the present people who are smarter than us or who have more resources than us are, are going to lock us into something which is bad. So that for me is like, that's one of the reasons why I'm so happy about this collaboration is that I, I sincerely believe we're not going to make it into a better future without art. Okay. And, and I just say so one, one thing just to, to follow up on this is that this, what Tim's talks about, putting the past into the present tense is, is a powerful idea and an important one. Uh, Professor Snyder, how do you see technology and social media companies in particular uh, contributing to the tyranny in our world? For example, censorship without recourse, having bank accounts shut down to eliminate access to commerce, internet providers deleting websites. 
So I guess let me start even bigger on that one. There's a basic problem of centralization. So, I mean, before we even get to like who gets to have access to what, um, which is not personally my primary concern, I, I would just, I would point to the problem of centralization. That whatever you think about Facebook's decision here or Twitter's decision there, there's no way that these entities should have this much power. There's just, that just simply should not have happened. This kind of monopoly relationship should not have been allowed to arise. The more so since the United States has laws on the books, the Sherman Act and the Antitrust Act, which would, which should, if you just read them, they should prohibit exactly the kind of situation which has arisen. But from from my point of view, I have to say I'm much less concerned about like this billionaire being shut down or that billionaire being shut down because those billionaires are going to find other ways. I don't really care, honestly. That does not rise very high on the list of like the things I'm worried about. With it, what I worry more about is the general way that these companies shape the way humans relate, because the the, the net effect is we spend less time communicating with each other in person. We spend more time interacting without seeing each other, which makes us treat us work, treat, treat one another worse. The net effect is that we are constantly being fed stuff, following behavioristic algorithms, which draws us towards our worst selves, which makes us more, which bestializes us, basically, for lack of a better word, so that um, so that we, so our politics become more polarized because we're being taught constantly that everything is about what makes us feel good or what makes us afraid. And life kind of gets, to, you know, that's their profit model. They keep our eyes on the screen that way. And that's terrible for politics. And it makes democracy almost impossible because democracy has to be about, a, you know, floating, floating agreements about different sets of policy issues. It has to be about citizens recognizing common interests with some citizens sometimes and other citizens other times. It can't be about us and them. Us and them is authoritarianism. Us and them is, is tyranny. And social media drives us towards, towards us and them. And this is a good follow-up question to that. How have people being locked in their homes during COVID limited our diversity of thought and made us too reliant on media rather than lived experience and interaction slash feedback from those around us? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that uh, the, the, I mean, if there's anything good that we can draw from this, we can, we, we've realized that being at home all the time, staring at a screen the whole time is not good. Right. We had to, we had, I remember at the beginning of all this, I was, I was hanging out with some people from Silicon Valley who were like, not to be too mean, but they were kind of excited about the pandemic because they thought like, this is going to prove how like digital education is terrific. And the, the future, all we're going to want to do is, and let's face it, like that didn't work. Like nobody learned anything. No, I mean, as a first approximation, nobody learned anything. Kids lost a year or more of their education. And in addition to what we didn't learn, we got worse at dealing with one another at, at human beings. So like, that's a, I mean, that's a lesson that I think we should remember because the propaganda about how great all this stuff is, is going to come back before, before we know it. And yeah, I mean, when I, you know, when I think of, so I was in the hospital during the beginning of the pandemic. And when I came out, the first thing I did, I mean, the first actual physical thing I did was I put on a suit and I put on a mask and I went to a black lives matter protest. And like, I was sure I was doing the right thing, but it was also just, great to be with a bunch of strangers and half strangers and people that I kind of knew or didn't, you know, and, and to be out being myself and expressing myself in the three dimensional world. And like, just the taste of that was, I mean, the, 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 the occasion was a very sad one, but the taste of being with other people was nevertheless very sweet. Like that I, I knew that I, I'm not a particularly extroverted person, but I knew that I needed that. And I think we all miss that. And like the saddest thing is for, the hardest thing, like I think of this as a parent, as an educator now, like it's very hard to get young people to become comfortable with that. And we've just, we've just had a couple of years, which are going to make it all the harder. You know, if yeah. I can just comment a little bit on that question, you know, we, those of us who are old enough to remember the Vietnam War, remember when we would watch TV and there were like, you know, three, basically three channels and all those channels were, their news was governed by a fairness doctrine policy. And that was that you weren't, you, you know, you weren't supposed to just tell things that were total lies. You weren't supposed to. So therefore, you would have different opinions, for example, about the Vietnam War, Walter Cronkite, et cetera. But you also had an element of fairness. Now, that was what deregulation, uh, that was taken away for all the cable news networks. They don't have to do that. 
I mean, this is another element. It actually could be, it was a policy decision. It could be altered through policy. Um, this next question, what types of what types of modern tyrannical behavior do you see on the right and the left in business and academia? Um, is that is that for me, I guess? I mean, so sure. so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take aim at the false parallel there. Like so the idea that like academia is out there in the forefront of tyranny, you know, I'm not I'm not gonna go with that. Also in in business, I mean business is a big category for me. The main problem in the U.S. is not business. I mean, I I like markets. I like businesses. I like small businesses. I like medium-sized businesses. The main tyrannical factor in commercial life is monopoly. I mean, and and the main the main political one of the main political problems in U.S. life is that the more money you have, the more influence you have, and that means that a few companies have way just way more influence than they ought to have. It means one way that we're not really a democracy is that. There are a few institutions with with you know basically unlimited funds to spend on 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 influence and that just shouldn't be like that right and that's not a matter of the right or the left it's like a structural issue you know from Plato like plenty of people who are not bleeding heart liberals from Plato all the way to Friedrich Hayek all knew that terrific inequalities of wealth or what we call monopoly is going to be a problem for democracy so I'm not going to call that the right I'm just going to say that's a structural problem with the U S. As far as campuses, I mean, like, I guess, like, I live with students all the time. Like, this is what I do. You know, I would venture to say that I have more experience with students at elite universities than anybody who comments on them because it's my line of work, right? Like, if I were a butcher, I would feel the same way about that, right? I would feel, I would find it weird that suddenly everybody in the public sphere is talking about what it's like to be a butcher. I find it weird that everybody in the public sphere is suddenly talking about what it's like to be a professor. Like, I have a pretty good idea of what it's like. And the basic truth about it is that the four years that students get to spend in universities are the freest years of their life in America. They're more or less free of their parents, and they're more or less free of their jobs, which are going to prevent them from saying things that they don't, that they might want to say. That's the basic truth. I mean, in university, people are more free than they're going to be elsewhere. Students say crazy things sometimes, right? They do. But isn't the important thing that there's some place where they can do that, where they can experiment, where they're not instantly, where the whip is not instantly cracked by their parents or by public opinion or by the internet or by some peer group or by their boss? The campus is the one place where the whip in America, where the whip is not instantly cracked. And the, and the campus is the one place where kids are going to learn unpredictable things from people they've never heard of, right? So I, I agree that like there are some, there's some wackiness at Yale. You know, there's some wackiness at other campus campuses. Sometimes students are wrong, of course, you know, like other people are. But if you want to get rid of Amer freedom in America, what you should do is organize a campaign against the campuses and, and, and like spout nonsense about there isn't free speech on campus. For me, that's totally Orwellian. Um, there is more free speech on campus than there is in any other part of American life which I'm happy to demonstrate, right? I mean, here I am, I've written these books which are incredibly critical about pretty much everything in American political life. I can say whatever I wanna say and no one's gonna fire me. Tell me that that's, tell me how true that is in other parts of American life. Tell me how the people on Fox News can, criti can criticize the Murdoch family or whatever. They can't, right? So if you wanna get rid of free speech in America, target the campuses. And if you wanna do it in an Orwellian way, talk about how there's no free speech on campus. And that's what's going on. I mean, there's a campaign against the place, the one place where there really is free speech, there's a campaign against us. So let's let's think about what that means. Yeah, I think one of the most important uh, parts of education in general is to to learn, uh, you know, to, to criticize uh, or to, uh, you know, to, to learn critical thinking and also to be able to redefine and rethink who we should be or could be as a society. I mean, the idea that we, we can redefine that, we can reinvent that, and I agree that I think those are one of the few places where that's possible at all in our society. Um, Professor Snyder, you mentioned earlier the Sherman Act and antitrust laws. What other aspects of our current government should we be trying to fight for more to prevent tyranny? Individual rights, state rights, aspects of the Constitution? Well, I think as, I mean, Again, returning this question of like what the future should be like and what art can do. We as citizens of the United States, 
need to have a much more expansive idea of what freedom is. Because one of the things which is happening to us slightly under the radar is that the value of freedom has been subordinated to a very legalistic understanding of the Constitution. So our rights are being whittled away, especially our right to vote, our right to have representatives are being whittled away by people who find like this turn of phrase in this law, this turn of phrase in this law, and who are writing laws um, to restrict the franchise and to make Americans less free. And that is the normal scenario in the 21st century. That's what happened in Hungary. It's what happened in, in Russia. Like you don't have to break any laws. We did have an attempted coup in this country, but you don't, you know, and maybe there'll be another one, but you don't have to have that. You can just write the laws in such a way that they're uninformed by values. And so Americans have to have a much bigger and more expansive notion of freedom than we have. I think what's what, one of our problems is that we use the word a lot, but we're not really sure what we mean by it, right? And one basic thing that we should mean by it is that, for example, is that everybody should have the right to vote. Now, so I'm just, I, I realized the question was about government, but I mean, the point of the whole point of view of the book is that you're kind of going to get the government that you deserve. And if you don't have the concepts, like the courageous concepts, the ideas of the future, then the government that you, that you get is going to be a tyrannical one. But like, if I were going to name one thing that, you know, very specifically the Biden administration should do, I think the Biden administration should be worried about factuality. I think that we, you know, we need to have some kind of Manhattan project. Okay, that's not the best technology, but we have to have some kind of like space launch, you know, Apollo type program to restore local news, to restore local factuality. Because American debates, let's face it, American debates right now are kind of crazy, right? Why, like, why when I go to Ohio, do I have to listen to talk radio about what happens in like Ivy League universities? Who cares? What matters, you know, when I'm when I'm going back to Ohio, which is where I'm from. The local news should be about stuff in Ohio. It should be about like the water pollution or the school board. It should be about the stuff that's happening in your, in your life. And most most of America is now a news desert. Like most of America has no local reporting. Most Americans have no way of finding out whether their local politicians are corrupt. They have no way of finding out who's making donations to who. You know, they have no way of finding out about pollution. Not, there's nothing, right? And when we don't have that, not only is our own life going to be worse because the local you know life actually happens locally. It means that we're going to become, we're going to care about national stuff, which maybe isn't that important, or international stuff, or we'll be drawn to conspiracies or fictions or whatever it might be. That's what's happened. You know, that goes back to the question about social media and monopoly. Social media and, and its monopoly have crowded out the, the way that for the previous hundred years, Americans found out what was going on in their lives. So if I were the Biden administration, like that's the moonshot that I would be aiming for is giving Americans, you know, not about, it's not about politics, it's about stuff which is pre-political, giving Americans basic knowledge about what's happening in their own lives. Let them have that knowledge and then let them think about more abstract kinds of politics. Thank you. Um, do you see the vaccine, vaccine mandates as an example of tyranny as some people do? Do you think it could slip into that based on what we've seen with police responding aggressively to some people choosing to not wear masks or be vaccinated? So I feel like this is a series of American questions directed to me, which is slightly unfair to, <laughs> to, 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 to Nora. Um, I mean, so let's talk about what freedom actually is then, because like, is freedom my ability to punch you in the face? I mean, generally the view is that it's not, right? So it, do I have the freedom? Let I me, mean, let's say I have a terrible infectious disease. Uh, do I have the freedom to breathe that into your lungs? I would say by the same principle, I probably don't, right? I think one of our problems in the US is that we get to thinking that freedom is just about what I feel like, you know, and then like, if I can't do what I feel like, I'm frustrated and that's tyranny. But if that's our only notion of freedom, we end up getting like, we end up with a really narrow area of stuff we care about. And we stop caring about things which are, which are much more important to freedom. Like, can I be healthy? Can my children get a good education? Like all these things that have to do with the future get somehow just get removed and I'm obsessing about whether I have to wear a mask or not. Um, and, and honestly, like I'm perplexed by the whole mask thing because there's like the world is so full of things that involve freedom and this is just trivial. It just doesn't really matter whether you, I mean, whether you wear a mask or not, right? I mean, the people who say you shouldn't wear masks, like I'm sure they think women should wear bras, you know, like these are just like, these are not issues which seem to me to be very high in like the list of what really freedom is about. With vaccines, 
you get to the issue, people want to talk about responsibility, but you don't have to get to responsibility. The question is whether I have the freedom to get you sick. And I think the answer is not. And there's also a question of like, are we a freer country if people are healthy? I think the answer is yes, right? I mean, Jefferson said there was a right to life. Jefferson said there was a right to liberty. What is the thing which is between life and liberty? Health. And what did Jefferson say about health? He said it was the most important thing in the world after ethics. Given what we know about health now, I think one way we can become freer as a people is by trying to be healthy for, for one another, right? So that's, that's where I come down on this issue. This issue. I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I, I think that like sometimes being, if you're gonna be free, you have to recognize that other people, are, other people should also be free. It's not just like my ability to hit you in the face, it's also your ability not to be hit in the face. It's, and if we think take that principle of two people and we take it further, then it's a very small step to thinking, yeah, we would all be freer if we would act in such a way that we'd all respect one another. I mean, not only is the outcome that we're all freer, but also that respect is a respect for the other person's freedom. And if the other person's not free, then freedom doesn't mean anything. I think that's exactly right. I mean, freedom demands responsibility in a democratic uh, society. And that's the, the way that we should look at freedom, not at this very narrow, narrow, narrow down uh, individual where the individual wants to believe what they want to believe, even if it's not true, uh, that's freedom. And that's, I think, one of the problems that we're up against. Thank you. Um, for Nora, Nora, is there civics education in German schools or has it been abandoned as it has here? Um, we don't have a, I mean, I can only talk to when I was a, a student because I haven't lived in Germany for almost 20 years. Um, but there, there wasn't a civics class per se. We had uh, one class called ethics, but that was really just an alternative if you didn't take Christian a Catholic or Protestant education class, you were kind of stuck with what was called ethics. Um, and unfortunately, I, I chose Catholic class uh, at the time. Um, so some of these valuable conversations, I think, took place in this uh, non-religious uh, class. Um, but of course, we had a very strong history class. I mean, we learned an immense amount about the Second World War and the Holocaust which I think informed most of my fellow German, West Germans, at least, uh, minds and, and sense of democracy and agency, personal agency, uh, which is still, I think, very much at the forefront of a lot of Germans' minds today. Yeah, I know we're almost at the end of the hour, but I had two different people ask the same question, which is, will there be a film version of On Tyranny? Um, there, there have been, there have been discussions about it. Um, it's it 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 could it could happen. There it, it's it's not you're not the first two people who've had this idea. Let me put it. Let me put it. <laughs> but like it, it, I'm talking to a bunch of people in LA, so you probably know more than me about this. I'll, I'll see what I can make happen. Yeah, well, I'll, yeah, I'll let's, take let's some call. See what you can do, Jessica. You, you get on that. <laughs> That sounds good. Well, when it does become a film, I would be happy to have you back, Professor Snyder, and, and we can do a screening and another Q&A afterwards. So thank you so much for this uh, enlightening discussion. And Daryl, I'm going to turn this back over to you. Thank you so much. Well, thanks so much, uh, Tim and Nora, and, and thanks to, 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 to the World Affairs Council and Town Hall for sponsoring it. I mean, I, I really I really found it to, to, to be a useful discussion. Um, I, I really would hope that that this edition of the book will be a kind of a launch pad for for really more political activism to try to defend our uh, democracy and to uh, protect it for our children and our grandchildren. And I just spent yesterday with my grandchild, who's one year old, and I just kept coming back to this kind of feeling about what are we doing with our country? So thanks so much, Tim. Thanks so much, Nora. Thank you so much for having me and us. Yeah, thanks to the World Affairs Council for, for inviting us and thanks to all of you who asked questions. I really, I really appreciate the exchange. Professor Snyder, Nora Krug, and our wonderful moderator, Daryl Holter. This was such a sobering and moving program. I, I can't wait to order the book. It's available this week. So please, I encourage everybody to read it and I hope You'll come back, all of you, because this is such an important ongoing discussion.
Thank you so very much. For our viewers, I wanted to share some upcoming programs. Tomorrow, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus. On October 7th, a conversation with Edison International President and CEO Pedro Pizarro on California's pivotal climate change movement. On October 12th, again, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus, stands on at a new time, 5 p.m. On the 13th, Risk, a user's guide with General Stanley McChrystal. And on the 15th, a conversation with Dr. Fiona Hill, moderated by Doyle McManus from the Los Angeles Times. The 21st, we have Social Media, The Dark Side, a conversation with Roger McNamee. So please go to our website at lawacth.org, register today, become a member, make a donation. We can't do this without you. Please stay safe, stay informed, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Take care, everyone.